What's up? Medite here. Let's talk about the anatomy of the central nervous system. In this segment, we will be talking about the external anatomy of the spinal cord. Basically go through everything you need to know in regards to what the spinal cord is and what you will find grossly on the spinal cord. Alright, so the central nervous system consists of two parts, the encephalon and the spinal cord. So in this video, we're first going to go through the topography of the spinal cord, basically where it is and where it starts and ends. Then we will focus on the external surface of the spinal cord, basically going through all the grooves and fissures you see here. We're also going to go through the segments of the spinal cord and look at its relationship with the vertebral column. Then we will go through the enlargements we see on the spinal cord. After that, we will look at the anatomy of the spinal nerve and understand its four branches and then quickly understand the type of reflex arches we can have throughout the spinal cord. The internal structures and all the nuclei and tracts will be covered in the next video so that this video doesn't get too long. Alright, so here we see a posterior view of the vertebral column. If we remove one vertebrae and zoom in, you will see the spinal cord right here, going through the vertebral canal. So let's go ahead and take the spinal cord out. Now the spinal cord is covered by a meningeal layer called the dura mater. And if we remove the dura mater, you will find the arachnoid mater. And if we remove the arachnoid mater, you will see a very thin and delicate connective tissue covering called the pia mater. And if we remove that, we will finally get to the actual spinal cord. These three are what we call the meninges, and they cover the whole central nervous system. We will go through the meninges in a separate video, but for now, let's do the topography of the spinal cord. So the spinal cord starts off at the foramen magnum, all the way to the L1, L2 vertebra region. The length of the spinal cord varies a lot, but in general, it's about 40 to 45 centimeters long. If we now remove the bones, you will see that the spinal cord ends by a structure called the medullary cone, or conus medullaris. From here, a very thin thread goes out called the filum terminale, which literally translates as a terminal thread because it's considered as a continuation of the spinal cord. And if we see here, the filum terminale continues downwards together with a lot of different nerves that innervate the lower part of the body with nerves. And this area with all the nerves is called the cora equina. So that was it for the topography. Let's now take a small part of the spinal cord and look at the external surface of it. So here is the external surface of the spinal cord. This is the internal surface of the spinal cord, which we will talk about in the next video. And these nerves we see here on the sides are the spinal nerves. All right, now for some orientation. The anterior part is where you'll find this deep fissure. And the posterior part is more flat with small bumps. This fissure we see here on the anterior side is called the anterior median fissure. Then posteriorly, on the midline, you will find the posterior median sulcus. On either side of the spinal cord, you will find the right and the left posterior lateral sulci, and the right and the left anterior lateral sulci, from where the anterior and the posterior root of the spinal nerve are going to go through as you see here, and we will get back to this later when we talk about the spinal nerve. But now, let's talk about something called segments. Alright, so the vertebral column consists of 7 cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, and this varies, but usually you have 4 coccygeal bones fused together, adding a total of 33 vertebrae. Now the spinal cord is different in that it's divided into 8 cervical segments, not 7, but there are still 12 thoracic segments, 5 lumbar, 5 sacral, but there's only one coccygeal segment, which adds up to 31 spinal cord segments. Now, why do you think the spinal cord is divided into segments? That is because at each segment, there will be one spinal nerve emerging from either side, like you see here. Meaning that picture we saw earlier, with one spinal nerve going out, is one segment. So we have 31 of those you see here. And if we go ahead and add the nerves here, you will see that it looks like this. Now, if we take the vertebral column and the spinal cord and fuse them together, you will see this. You will see the spinal nerves going out from the vertebral column through the intervertebral openings or the intervertebral foramina. 
But if the spinal cord has 31 segments and the vertebral column has 33 segments, and as we know now from the topography, with the spinal cord ending at L1, L2 region, how are the spinal nerves arranged within the vertebral canal? And to answer that, we need to look at the spinal cord and the vertebra from this perspective. Let's now fade this picture a little bit and go through them part by part. At the beginning, the spinous process of the cranial cervical vertebrae, cranial meaning up towards the head, correspond to the same level as the spinal cord segment, and the spinal nerve leave above the first cervical vertebrae, as you see here. Then as we continue slowly downwards, you will see that the spinal nerve starts to bend, and now the spinous process of the caudal cervical vertebrae, caudal meaning towards the tail, or away from the head, it corresponds to one above the corresponding cervical spinal cord segment. And by that, I mean vertebrae C7 is at the same height as the spinal segment C8. So you could take segment plus one at this point, because the spinal cord is getting compressed. Then as we continue down, the spinal nerve bends even more. And at this point, the spinous process of the cranial thoracic vertebrae correspond to the thoracic spinous segment plus two. So you add two numbers to the vertebrae you're looking at. So vertebra T3 is at the level of the spinous segment T5. And as you slowly continue down, the differences start to be greater. The caudal thoracic vertebrae starts to correspond to the spinal segment plus three. And then as you continue further down, the T10, T12 vertebrae becomes at the level of the L1, L4 spinal cord segments. And then at the level of the T12, L1, we're starting to reach the end of the spinal cord, but not yet. So we call this area the epiconus, because remember, the medullary cone is at the end. Epi means above, so above the end of the spinal cord. That's what epiconus means. This corresponds to L5, S2 spinal cord segments. And then lastly, at the L1, L2 region, you have the rest of the spinal cord, from S3 to S5, plus one coccygeal segment. This scheme is just to help you visualize how the spinal cord is arranged within the vertebral column. Now, as you look at the spinal cord anteriorly, you will notice two distinct enlargements. One called the cervical enlargement, which goes from the segment C3 to T2, and a lumbosacral enlargement, going from T12 down to the medullary cone. Now, why are these significant? Because at these regions, you have a bundle of nerves called plexuses, supplying the upper limb and the lower limb with nerves. And these nerves have to be large and in large quantity in order to innervate all the muscles of the lower limb and the upper limb with nerves. So the cervical enlargement formed the brachial plexus for the nerves that goes to both arms. And the lumbosacral enlargement is for the sacral and the lumbar plexuses, innervating structures in the pelvis and the legs. So these are very important. Now, since we're talking so much about the spinal nerves, let's really understand the anatomy of the spinal nerves. Because once you understand that, the actual internal and external surface of the spinal cord becomes more logical. So if we take a segment of the spinal cord again, you will see the internal surface here. And we will talk about this in detail in the next video, but the internal surface consists of grey matter and white matter. And how does this correlate with the spinal nerve? Because all the small neurons that go within the spinal nerves will synapse with nuclei in the grey matter. And I'll show you how. So first, you need to understand where the spinal nerve enters the spinal cord. The spinal nerve enters the spinal cord through the right and the left posterior lateral sulci, and the right and the left anterior lateral sulci. So let's animate it a little bit and add some structures to make it look a little more realistic. Here we see the meninges. So the red that's closest to the spinal cord is the pia mater. The blue lining is the arachnoid mater. And between the pia mater and the arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space filled with cerebrospinal fluid that provides nutrition to the spinal cord tissue. And then the outermost dense structure is the dura mater. So these are the meninges. And remember, the deep fissure is anterior, and the more flat surface is posterior. So here you see the spinal nerve. The spinal nerve is divided into two roots before it enters the spinal cord. It's divided into the posterior root, or the sensory root, 
and it's divided into the anterior root or the motor root. And I'll mention this again because I really want you to not forget this. Posterior root enter through the right and the left posterior lateral sulci and the anterior root enter through the anterior lateral sulci. But you will notice that on the posterior root there is a bulb, a small enlargement called the spinal ganglion or sometimes also referred to as a dorsal root ganglion. You're going to have many different types of ganglions in the body and the reason why ganglions are bubbly is because they contain many nerve cell bodies as you see here. So dendritic fibers go from the periphery towards the spinal ganglion and then axons of these neurons go into the spinal cord. Now remember from the previous video when we went through the different types of neurons, what kind of neuron do you think this is? These are pseudo-unipolar neurons going into the spinal cord. So they take the sensory information from anywhere in the body and then enter the spinal cord so that you can sense what's happening. So if you blow on your arm, that cold sensation is going to enter the spinal cord through this neuron. And once it enters the gray matter of the spinal cord, it can either synapse with an interneuron and go further up towards your higher senses so that you can make sense out of what's happening, or it can connect directly to a motor neuron which go out from the spinal cord to move a muscle to react in any way. And there's going to be a lot of connections to the motor neuron. Any voluntary movement you want to do either comes from the interneuron or the sensory neuron directly. So a spinal nerve consists of sensory fibers, motor fibers, and either sympathetic or parasympathetic nerve fibers. So in the spinal cord, you will find the sensory fibers back here, the motor fibers are in the front here, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers come from the lateral part of the spinal cord, and they come from the specific areas within the spinal cord. The segments C8 to L2 are responsible for sympathetic nerve response, while segments S2 to S4 give parasympathetic nerve response. And here's a quick way to remember this. S stands for stress, to remind you that sympathetic neurons are responsible for fight or flight response, or stress response, meaning it increases your heartbeat, makes you breathe faster, more alert, and all of those reactions are going to come from fibers that leave your spinal cord between C8 and L2 segments. The P in parasympathetic stands for peace, which is rest and digest. So you're chilling, you're sleeping, your intestines are doing its work to absorb the food and all those things come from neurons that emerge between S2 and S4 spinal segments. Now back to the spinal nerve. So once the spinal nerve leaves the spinal cord, it branches out into four parts. It becomes the ventral part, which supplies the skin and muscles of the limbs and the anterior and the lateral part of the trunk. And as they do that, they form plexuses. And we'll go through this when we go through the peripheral nervous system. But plexuses are a huge network of neurons that supply regions of your body. So we have a cervical plexus supplying areas associated with your neck and shoulders. The brachial plexus for your arms. The lumbar plexus for your legs and pelvis. And the sacral plexus for your pelvis and legs as well. So that is the ventral branch forming these plexuses. The spinal nerve is also going to divide into a dorsal branch for the skin and muscles of your back and neck. Then there's the white ramus communicans which relay sympathetic nerves. And those nerves are involuntary. So they, they reach out to organs you're not in control of like your smooth muscles and glands and your visceral organs. The last branch is a branch that goes back inside the vertebral canal to supply the meninges, called the meningeal branch. So it goes back through the intervertebral foramen to supply the meninges. So that was the general anatomy of the spinal nerve. The last thing I want to talk about in this video is a reflex arch. Within your body, we have two types of reflex arches. It's either going to be a quick unconscious reflex through a monosynaptic reflex and a more slower conscious reflex called multisynaptic reflex. Now the monosynaptic reflex are simple reflexes that go through one synapse. Remember synapse is when one neuron connects to another neuron. So there are only two neurons involved here. And a famous example is the patellar tendon reflex. Imagine you're at the doctor's office and your doctor wants to assess your peripheral nerve reflex response. So he takes up a hammer and taps your patellar tendon quickly, causing the leg to kick out. 
What happens is that the impact of the hammer triggers a stretch receptor neuron within your tendon that quickly fires the action potential towards your spinal cord, which then quickly triggers a motor neuron to activate that muscle. We can't suppress this reflex because it's physiological. It doesn't connect to any interneuron which goes up to your brain. A multisynaptic reflex is different and the withdrawal reflex is an example of that. So let's start here by a candle triggering temperature and pain receptors on your hand. The pain is sent through sensory neurons to your spinal cord, which triggers interneurons that goes up to your brain and trigger an ouch response, as well as quickly triggering a motor neuron to remove your hand as quickly as possible. It requires more neurons and it's a conscious movement. So that was all I had for the external structures of the spinal cord and the anatomy of the neuron and its reflexes. Let's pause here so that this video doesn't get too long and let's do the internal tracts and nuclei of the spinal cord in the next video.